Good morning. It is good to be in the house of the Lord with you today. And if you have your Bibles, please turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And it is such a joy to be able to be here in the house of the Lord, to have the freedoms that we have, because men were willing to sacrifice their lives and pay for that freedom. And we are grateful to be here today. I'd like to begin this morning by reading the last three verses of chapter 9 of 1 Corinthians. Hear the word of the Lord this morning as we read from 1 Corinthians 9, beginning in verse 24. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for the amazing grace that You have offered us in Jesus Christ. Lord, we cannot earn salvation. We cannot earn Your love, but You give it to us freely. And Lord, I pray this morning as we look at this text, we would be motivated by that grace to run the race You have set before us. Lord, I pray that we would be motivated by the great mercy and love of God to run this race with complete devotion to You. Help us this morning, we pray. Amen. When I was in college, I was about 20 years old, I remember sitting around in a dorm room talking with a bunch of guys that I was friends with, and I remember talking with this one guy and he said, I have been training for a half marathon. A half marathon is 13 miles. And he said, I've been working up to this and I've been going out and I've been training every day for the past month or so. And I got one coming up in a couple of months and I've been training for this half marathon. Now me, when I was 20 years old, was not too smart. And I was pretty arrogant, I hate to admit. And I made the comment to him, why would you train for a half marathon? That would be easy. All you have to do is just not stop running. Anyone could do that. Then ensued a conversation back and forth between me and my friends, and a bet was made that I could not run a half marathon without training. Just go go in cold turkey. Well, I went and signed up for a half marathon. I said, I certainly can. I can go out. It's easy. There's no problem. I can absolutely do this. So I spent... The next two months, not training, not doing any type of exercise or work. And we show up on the day of the race and I'm looking around. It was in downtown Greenville and all these people are stretching, they're working, getting ready. And I am standing there thinking, I have made a huge mistake. (laughs) This was not a good idea. The race started, I did pretty good for a little bit, but then I started crashing pretty hard. I got a second wind, but it didn't really help me. I will say, I did complete the half marathon. I completed the race, but I would not say I won the race. Because afterwards, my feet were blistered, I was sore for about a week and a half, and I could hardly move. So I did finish, but I wouldn't say that I won the race. Now I tell you that story this morning... Because Paul, in this passage, likens our Christian life to a race that we are all to run. And he says that we are not just cruising along, just kind of jogging for fun, but he says that in the race, all runners run, but one receives the prize. So run that you can obtain it. There is a goal that we run our Christian life for, and there is a finish line waiting for us. And for each and every one of us here in this room, there is a finish line. After we die, we will stand before the Lord and we will face judgment. And if we have believed in Jesus Christ as our Lord, 
then he will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into my rest. But if we don't give our lives to Jesus, if we choose to run a different race, not for Christ, then he will say, depart from me, for I never knew you. Now, as we're going to look at this text today, we're going to be thinking about how we can run this race well. But I do want to say from the outset, I don't think it's as much of how well you run the race, but which race track are you on? I think many of us can run the race for Jesus and we can go and we can give our lives for Him and we can be fully devoted to Him because of the grace that He's given to us. But I think some others of us want to get on a different racetrack. A different racetrack that is focused on myself, on my self-indulgence, on my desires. And we reject Jesus on that track. And I want to ask for those sitting here today, which track are you on? Which race are you running? A race that is for Christ, complete devotion to Him and submission to His will? Or are you running on a different track and running a different race all about you for yourself? We're going to see today as we look at chapter 9 of 1 Corinthians four ways to run the race or four ways to recognize that you are on the right track. Last week, Paul talked in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 about eating food that was sacrificed to idols. And Paul is continuing this this thought in chapters 8, 9, and 10 of 1 Corinthians. They are all about this same question that the Corinthians were asking. Which was in chapter 8, can we be a Christian and eat food that's been sacrificed in the temple to pagan gods? Right, And we talked last week extensively about, can I be a Christian and do this? And Paul's response to them in chapter 8 was, yes, you are free to do it, but maybe you shouldn't do it for the sake of your brothers. You are free to do certain things. You are free to do a lot of things, but maybe you should give up your rights for the sake of other people. Paul continues that thought, and I want to share that with you right at the outset, because the whole chapter 9 is a picture of Paul's life. How he has given up his rights for other people so that the gospel could go out. And I pray that as we look at the text this morning, we would see the life of Paul, someone who has renounced his rights and who has run the race for Jesus, and that we too might give up our rights and our freedoms so that we could run the race for Christ. So the first thing that we see is that we run to serve the church. If you are running this race, if you want to see if you're on the right track or not, you need to run to serve the church. In the first 14 verses, Paul talks about the church. He talks about apostles and leaders in the church. And he makes an argument that the church should support its leaders financially. He makes this statement that the church should support them and give money to the church in order to support its leaders. And again, I want to frame this in the way that Paul is speaking. We are free to have all of the things that we want, but we give up those things in order to serve the church. And here specifically, he says you are free to have the money that God has given you and blessed you with. But would you give up that money in order to serve the church and to serve Christ's kingdom? He gives four reasons from Scripture, and we're going to go through them briefly, about why he thinks that the church should support its leaders financially. The first is that the other apostles and leaders in the church and other churches are receiving money financially. And so he tells the Corinthian church, hey, y'all should be able to support me, the leader, financially. Look at verse 5. He says, do we not have the right to take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas, which is Peter? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? He says, the other churches and the other apostles have this partnership where people give to the church and they support them. Why would you, the Corinthians, not support me in the same way? He then gives a view from the natural world. Look at verse 7. 
Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Or who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruit? Or who tends a flock without getting some of the milk? He essentially said, if you were to go and you were to serve in the military, and you said, you know what, I want to serve our country, and I want to serve in the military, the military does not look at that person and say, okay, well, you need to bring your own gun, right? You need to pave your own way. You need to have all the equipment. No, the military would provide those things. And he says, in the same way, if a pastor or an apostle is coming and teaching, then he deserves to be paid, He then moves to a section in verses 8 through 12 from Scripture. He says that they deserve payment because it is said so in the law. Look at verse 8. Do I say these things on human authority? Does the law not say the same? For it is written in the law of Moses, You shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Is it for oxen that God is concerned? Does He not certainly speak for our sake? It was written for our sake because the plowman should plow in hope and the thresher thresh in hope of sharing in the crop. If we have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? He's essentially saying, hey, in the Old Testament, there was a law. You shouldn't muzzle an ox while it's treading out the grain. And essentially, he's saying, hey, while the oxen is working, you shouldn't put a muzzle on him. You should let him eat freely because he is working. And Paul simply says here, he says, it's not in the law so that the oxen can go pull up the law and tell its owner, hey, we want to be able to eat. He says it's in there for our sake, for the apostles. And he says, if... We have sown spiritual things among you. Shouldn't we receive material things from you? And then he finally concludes in verse 13 with an argument from the pagan temple worship. The worship of pagan gods and idols. He says they do the same thing. Why should we not? Look at verse 13. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple? And those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings. Verse 14, In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. So Paul lays out the case here that the church should give money financially, people in the church should give money financially, and it should support the people working in the church. And I think a principle here is that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. And, you know, this can be a sensitive subject. It can be a tricky subject. Some people say, oh, well, I like the pastor, so I'll give. Or I don't like the pastor and what he's doing, so I won't give. And they'll have all of these readings, all of these things and thoughts. But I do think that it's clear from Scripture. It says the Lord commands this is how we work as a church. That we pull our resources and we pull our money in order to serve the kingdom. And Paul is talking specifically here about paying leaders and pastors. But I think the principle goes much deeper. We give our money not just to pay salaries, but we give our money to see people's lives changed by the gospel. We give so that people would know Jesus We are having a baptism today. That'll be the 16th baptism today since the month of January. And we've got a few more scheduled for the month of June or July. And I just want to say that if you give to Shady Grove, you are giving to see people's lives changed by the gospel. We are taking a trip up to Pennsylvania in a few weeks and we are going, we're taking 17 people and we're going to be going and sharing the gospel with people who've never heard. When you give money to the church, it is going to see lives transformed by the gospel. And I think Paul puts this here in this section in 1 Corinthians to say, you know what? You have every right to keep your money. You have every right and freedom to hang on to that money. But would you give up that right so that the church could be served? Would you give up that right so that people would know Jesus? And I just want to say, we are blessed here at Shady Grove. We are blessed by people who give incredibly generously and sacrificially. But I do want to say, if you've been coming to Shady Grove and you haven't been giving financially, I do ask that you would consider giving to the Lord. And I do want to say, God doesn't necessarily need your money. God can do whatever He wants with whatever is given and provided. But I do want to say, if you choose not to give, 
then I think you're hurting your own heart and your own spiritual walk. I think Paul gives us a principle as we're going to see as we run this life in the Christian life, as we run this race, we give we live, run this race with sacrificial giving and a sacrificial heart saying, you know what, Lord, it's not mine. And I'm not running this race to build up my kingdom and what I want, but I'm running this race to give it up for you. And so we see that first, we run to serve the church. Secondly, we run to serve the gospel. We run to serve the gospel. Now, Paul spends half the chapter... 14 verses laying out why he thinks he deserves to be paid for preaching the gospel to the first Corinthians. But then he does something incredible. Look at verse 15. But I have made no use of any of these rights, nor am I writing these things to secure any such provision. For I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of the ground for boasting." You know what Paul's saying here? He says, I deserve payment from the church. He said, but you know what? I've never taken a dime from the Corinthians. I've actually been a tent maker for the past three years, and it has been my great joy in life to give up that right of receiving funds for, from you in order to preach the gospel to you. I think Paul modeled this idea of a life where he gives up his life and his rights for other people. Now, we know that Paul received money from the Philippian church, he received money from the Macedonian church, other places, but for some reason, he chose with the Corinthians not to receive money from them. And we don't know what it is, Paul doesn't explicitly state, but for some reason, he thought that the gospel could go out farther and better if he doesn't receive funding from them. Look at what he says in verse 16. For if I preach the gospel, that gives me no grounds for boasting. For necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am still entrusted with a stewardship. What then is my reward? That in preaching, I may present the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel." Paul is saying here that he has one singular focus and mission in this life. And that is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is to focus on this gospel. And he says, whether you pay me or you don't pay me, I'm going to preach Jesus. I'm going to preach Christ crucified. And I have to think that Paul, in the book of Acts, was breathing threats against the church. He was a man who was persecuting and murdering Christians. And God met him on the Damascus Road. And God changed his life. And ever since then, Paul has been completely different. Ever since then, Paul has been completely changed. And I, I love, in Amazing Grace, that song we just sang. It says, when I think back to the hour I first believed. Do you remember that moment in your life? When you first gave your life to Jesus, when everything changed, is that fire still going for you? Do you remember that feeling? Can you still have that in your life? Paul had this calling to preach the gospel. He says, paycheck or no paycheck, I'm going to preach it. I'm going to run this race to serve the gospel. I remember being in school and uh, I had to write papers and do projects for school. And you know what I always hated? Whenever I would get the topic for a paper from the professor, when they would say, hey, you have to write a 15-page paper on this. I remember I would sit in front of my computer and I would say, I don't know anything about this. I don't care anything about this. And it was difficult to churn out the pages for that. But have you ever had something that you just got passionate about? That it wasn't a school assignment, you weren't getting paid for it, but you're like, you know what, I'm just passionate about this. And you could go and do that assignment or do that work, and it was just life-giving to you. Because nobody was paying you, it interests you, you cared about it. There's a difference between getting an assignment and having a calling for something you love. And I'm afraid, church, that most of us treat the gospel like an assignment instead of a calling. Most of us walk around and we say, oh, well, 
I have to do this great commission thing. I have to go and tell people about Jesus. I have to show uh, grace and forgiveness to people. But I think the model that Paul shows us here in running the Christian race is not I have to do this, but I get to do this. No matter if I have to give up certain things, give up my rights, give up my paycheck, whatever it may be, I get to do this thing. And I want to ask today, is the gospel that important to you? What would you be willing to give up for the gospel message of Jesus that you could tell others, that you could be changed by it? If you want to run the Christian race, we run to serve the church, and we run to serve the gospel. Third, we run to serve the lost. We run to serve the lost. Not only does Paul renounce his paycheck, but he renounces other rights that he has in order to share the gospel with those who are lost. Look at verse 19. He says, For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. And then he goes on to say, To the Jews I became a Jew in order to win the Jews. And to those under the law I became as one under the law, that I might win those under the law. And to those outside the law I became one outside the law, that I might win those outside the law. And to the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. And look at what he says, I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. Paul says, you know what? I don't really care about my rights. I care about the lost, knowing and following Jesus. He says, you know what? I'm going to go to the Jews and I'm going to dress a certain way and I'm going to say certain things and they have rights and rituals and religious practices and I'm going to adhere to those while I'm talking to them. And then I'm going to go over here to the Greeks and I'm going to dress a certain way and talk a certain way and love them. And he says, I'm going to give up these rights in order to serve the lost. And I want to ask, what are you willing to give up in order to share with the lost? And oftentimes we think, you know what? If I share with somebody, it'll make things awkward in our relationship. If I, if I go and talk to them, I, I don't know what they'll think of me. And we have all of these reasons not to share. Are you willing to give up your fear, your anxiety, the peer pressure, in order that people might hear the gospel of Jesus Dawson Trotman, he's the founder of The Navigators. It's a group um, that seeks to share the gospel and disciple others in the faith. Dawson Trotman lived back in the 50s, and he made uh, a commitment to the Lord for a season of his life. And he said, you know what? For this season of my life, I commit to God that I'm going to share the gospel with one person every day. At least one person every day for this season, I'm going to share the gospel with them. And so he begins doing this, and every day he's going out and he's sharing with somebody. Well, one day, after a period of time, he, he goes to work, he comes home, he watches TV, he eats his meal, he puts his pajamas on, brushes his teeth, gets in bed, he's in bed. It's about 11 o'clock at night, and he jolts up in the bed. And he says, I didn't share with anyone today. He says, oh my gosh. I've broken that commitment. Now, most of us would probably say, you know what? I'll go back to sleep, and I'll just share with two people tomorrow, right? That might be what most of us would say. But Dawson Trotman, he says, you know what? I've made this commitment for the Lord. I'm going to get up. And he gets up, and he puts on his clothes, and he goes out, and he starts driving around. He lived in a rural area, and so it wasn't a big city where there was a lot of stuff going on, and there was nobody out on the road at 1130 at night. And he was driving, and he was praying, and he said, Lord, just give me somebody to share with. I've made this commitment to you, and I want to keep it. Give me somebody to share with. And as he turned on a small two-lane road, he saw a car that was broken down on the side of the road. A man had had a flat tire. And Dawson Trotman pulled up to that man, and he got out, and he said, can I help you? And he says, yeah, I need help fixing this flat tire. And he helped him change the tire, and Dawson Trotman looked at him, and he said, the Lord got me out of bed so I could come and share the gospel with you. He shared with that man, and that man believed in Jesus Christ and prayed to receive Him as Lord that night. Church, what are we willing to give up for the sake of the gospel. What are we willing to give up so that the lost might be found? Dawson Trotman said, I'm going to give up my comfort and my sleep so that the lost might be found. In church, what are we willing to give up? Our comforts, our fears, our anxiety, our worry, 
Are we willing to give those things up to say, you know what, it matters to run this race and to share with the lost. So we run to serve the church, to serve the gospel, and to serve the lost. And finally, we run this Christian race to obtain the prize. We aren't running for nothing, as Paul says, but look in verse 24. Don't you know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Run your Christian race in this life that you may get the prize. Look at verse 25. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable So I don't run aimlessly and I don't beat or box as one beating in the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. He says there's a race and I'm going to run to get the prize. I'm going to run this Christian life to get the prize and I'm going to discipline my body and I'm going to live a disciplined life in order to get this prize. Go back to my story at the beginning, the half marathon story. I I ran that race and I was running and I was hurting pretty bad about mile nine. They have little marker signs and you know which mile you're at. And I come to mile marker nine and I turn the corner and there is a huge steep hill. And I'm thinking, I'm already dying at mile nine. This is terrible. And so I start going up this hill and I'm not going to lie. I was running pretty slow on mile nine, all right? I'm going pretty slow up this hill. And about that time, there were these two ladies who came up beside of me, and I will call them soccer moms, all right? They were two, maybe middle-aged ladies, seemed like very nice, but they were soccer moms. And I, if you remember, am in my 20s, right? I'm at the peak of my life right there in the 20s, and I'm running, and I see these soccer moms. One of them is pushing a stroller with a baby in it, and they begin to pass me. And 20-year-old self, I'm sitting there and I'm running, and internally, I say, all right, legs, we're going to have to put it into second gear, because we can't let these soccer moms pass me, all right? And so I said, okay, here we go, next gear, go. And you know what happened? Nothing. My legs didn't have another gear. And I watched as those soccer moms passed me, pushing that stroller, and they went past me, and they faded off in the distance, and I was defeated. They had left me in the dust. Now, I could have trained for two months before that half marathon, but I chose not to, right? And it backfired on me. I had those soccer moms passing me. I could have trained for two months, but I decided to eat Taco Bell and play video games instead, and it came back to hurt me. And I want to tell you today, in your Christian walk with the Lord, every day you have an opportunity to train for the Christian race. Every day you have an opportunity, a choice to make. Am I going to train myself to run for Jesus or am I going to choose other things? Every day we make choices. We can choose to sleep in a few extra minutes or we can wake up early and read our Bible before the day starts. Every day we can make choices. Am I going to keep scrolling on Facebook for another 20 minutes or am I going to get on my knees and pray to God? Am I going to go out with these friends and do all these things or watch TV? Or am I going to go to church and be around other Christians and have a Bible study with them? Every day we have choices to make. And I want to tell you, if you choose not to discipline yourself, if you choose not to train yourself up in the Lord like Paul has said, then you are going to get left in the dust. Now I do want to say, We are not saved by our works. Don't hear me say that you are saved because you do more or work harder. We are saved by grace alone through faith alone. But I do believe we will all stand before Jesus one day. We will all have to give an account. And When I stand before my Lord on that day, I want to look at Him with my head held up high. And I want to say, Lord, I ran as hard as I could for You. Lord, I trained and I worked hard and I did everything I possibly could to serve You and Your kingdom. I don't want to be standing there left in the dust. And you know what, Lord? I didn't really do much for you, your kingdom. I really focused on myself and my own choices. Church, would you discipline your body? Would you keep it under control? Lest after preaching to others, you yourself 
become disqualified. There is a race to be run, run to obtain the prize. I want to close with this. Two men, John Leonard Dober and David Nietzscheman, they were Moravian missionaries from Germany. In 1731, they had a former slave from the West Indies who had escaped. He came to their church in Germany and he told them about the plight of the slaves in the West Indies. And he says they desperately need a missionary to go and preach to them. They desperately need to hear the gospel. There is no one who is believing among the slaves there in the West Indies. And these men heard this and they said, well, maybe we could go and we could share with them. And he says, well, there's only one problem. You can't have access to these slaves. They have a very rigid schedule and they have really difficult owners And they say that they only go out and work in the fields and then they send them right back and they have no contact with anyone else. They said, in order to reach them, you must sell yourself into slavery to be among them, to be able to lead them. These two men, then and there, decided we will sell ourselves into slavery so that those men might hear the gospel of Jesus They made that commitment and they went out to a boat after they had packed up all their things, made preparations. And the tradition says as their family was weeping and waiting on the shore, they shouted from the ship, may the lamb that was slain receive the reward of this suffering. May the lamb that was slain receive the reward of this suffering. They ran a race where they gave up their rights for the kingdom of God. And I think the Lamb received the reward. I think that God got the glory. And I want to ask today, what are you willing to give up so that Jesus gets the glory in your life? What are you willing to give up? What race are you willing to run? One where you are focused on yourself and your desires and what you want to do? Or are you willing to step out and trust Jesus and say, you know what, Jesus, you have died and bled on the cross for me. I am willing to run this race for you. I will give up anything in order to serve you. Church, would we run the race for Christ today? Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would help us. Lord, it is hard to surrender. Lord, there are so many things that are vying for our attention and our affection. Lord, I pray that You would help us surrender to Christ today. Lord, that we wouldn't run the race for ourselves or our agenda or the things that we want, but Lord, we would run the race for Christ. That we would give ourselves fully to Him. Lord, I pray that you would help us this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.